Uber out with its second quarter results just a few minutes ago. The company beating on both the top and bottom lines. Uber coming in above mobility estimates, but a little bit shy of expectations on delivery. And then I want to talk about the guidance. Join us right now is Uber CEO Dara Kostrachaki, and it's great to see you, sir. How are you? Um, great to be here. Thanks. We've been uh, watching the markets, obviously, but a lot of questions about the consumer, about growth in this country. Uh, you are uh, perhaps one of the better barometers of all of this. So uh, let's talk about this past quarter, but let's also talk about uh, where you think things are headed. Well, Andrew, I think our results that were incredibly strong speak for themselves. Uh, we had gross bookings of uh, $40 billion, up 21% year on year, which is very similar to what we had last quarter. Chips growing 21% as well. Record adjusted EBITDA of $1.57 billion, up over 70% on a year on year basis. And it translated uh, into free cash flow uh, of $1.7 billion. So the company is really hitting on all cylinders. Uh, and what we see for the consumer is the consumer remains strong. Uh, especially in terms of their demand for our services. Uh, past so, the pandemic, the spend, consumer spend on services continues to right. be growing at higher rates than consumer spend uh, on retail. And that's absolutely showing in Uber in terms of our performance now and our performance going forward. And we've also looked at you know, different income cohorts of consumers as well. You know, For example, lower income cohorts of consumers they're actually growing their spend faster on our marketplace than higher income cohorts of consumers as well. So even when we dig to see, are there any early signs of weakness? We don't see any early signs of weakness as of now, so although we're always on our toes to be able to Do you think of yourself then as a barometer of what's happening in our economy or, or around this country and frankly the globe, given just how international the business is? Or do you think that you are, you're living on an island and it's uh, an idiosyncratic island and we shouldn't we shouldn't take too much away from it except to say that it's, it's working for Uber. Well, with 30 million trips a day, it's a pretty big island. Uh, but I would say that we've consistently proven that we can grow faster than the category. So I think that's something to take into account. We're the largest player. We've got the best <laughs> technical capability. So I think we will do right. better than the overall marketplace. And I do think that there are certain elements of Uber that are counter cyclical uh, when the job market weakens we get more drivers on the platform. We've got 7.4 million drivers and couriers on the platform. Uh, they earn $17.9 billion, uh, up over 20% on a year-on-year -year basis. So as more drivers come onto the platform, ETAs come down, prices come down. Uh, our merchants, for example, for Eats, are offering 70% more in terms of merchant-funded offers. So we're a channel that can really push demand when businesses need it or individuals uh, like our drivers need to make some extra cash. Tell, tell us what's going on on the each front, because, you know, one of the things that people complain about, and they don't complain just about Uber, they complain about DoorDash, they complain about everybody, is just how expensive getting food delivered to you, especially if you're a, a single person or even, even a, a two-person couple. It makes a lot of sense to get food brought to you maybe when you have four or five people. But uh, given all of the additional fees, um, uh, I would have thought that that would actually be one of the first places, if you thought that the economy was going to be challenged, that you'd start to see it. Yeah, Andrew, delivery has been a habit that has turned out to be much more sticky, whether you're uh, ordering for yourself or you're ordering for family. But we're very much investing in lowering prices. Um, our membership, for example, Uber One membership, which gets you no delivery fees uh, for uh, delivery for Uber Eats, gets you cash back on mobility. Those member ranks are at an all-time high. Over 50% of our volumes on delivery come from members, so they actually don't pay any delivery fees, and we continue to increase that percentage. At the same time, we're encouraging restaurants to offer more deals on Uber Eats as well, and we're bringing Uber One now to students so for just $4.99 a month. They can become Uber One members, and hopefully when they grow up and they become professionals, they can continue kind of the Uber habit going forward. So we do continue to invest in affordability, and it's definitely showing up in volumes. Volumes in Uber Eats are up 17 percent, similar to last quarter, and we're gaining category position in every single one of our top 10 markets on a year-on-year -year basis. Dara, let's talk about freight. Freight has been one of these businesses that actually has been uh, somewhat challenged. What's going on there? 
Yeah, freight has been challenged by the same weakness that you see in retail to some extent coming out of the pandemic. That hangover is not over. The freight team continues to execute really well in a very, very difficult market. The fact is right now, post-COVID, a lot of truckers came into the marketplace. Uh, marketplace prices came down, and those marketplace prices have not adjusted yet. We're watching very carefully, but in the meantime, our team continues to bring technology to essentially connect shippers uh, with truckers on a direct basis, kind of the next-gen uh, freight company, and we're very confident of, of the prospects there. But right now, the environment's a tough one.